for the service. Please turn off your video if you don't want to be recorded. Mike Landrum, who has given many fine presentations here over many years, is not going to let us down today, I'm sure. Mike Landrum will speak on art and religion. Thank you, Hollis. Now, this was advertised as a discussion, and I will give you an opportunity to uh, put in your two cents worth as I go. The human imagination is a powerful thing. It could be said that its existence is the reason we live. Our rich and endlessly inventive imagination is the source of all art, and we see that it has flourished for over 50,000 years. Now, I have a little work to do here to... get the slideshow. Oops. Uh, just a minute, just a minute. One of the things that arose from imagination is Zoom. There we go. Yes. Oh, sorry. What do I need to do here? No, it's okay. Uh, turn off your sound. There we go. Okay. Now you can use the mic. Yes. Uh, thank you for reminding people of the uh, program I did a few weeks ago on uh, cave art. Let me find the, the way to do that. Uh, should be if you go to slideshow. Uh, yes, to the right. yes, there it is. Should be the first option over there. Yep. There we go. There we go. Now, the role of art was early, uh, to, to the early tribes was clear enough. They, they inscribed paintings on the walls of caves, which became the first places of worship. And they must have been spooky coming out of the dark. And they were there for thousands of years. So various audiences, various congregations, if you will, during those thousands of years would come into the art come into the cave, shine their, their torches around, and see the animals that they feared and the animals that they hoped to capture for food. Here was a, an ox for food in the cave of Chauvet. Here was a rhinoceros, one of my favorite drawings in the whole show, was this magnificent rhinoceros's horn which you could see the, uh, the excitement and the, uh, the artist's enthusiasm for that rhinoceros's horn. So as humanity evolves, the need to make worship more accessible brought us outside. Are we okay? Yeah, good. Turn it so people can see. <clears throat> Uh, first, they would, they would worship around the campfire, and the gods would appear as costumed people sometimes, and we showed some of those before, uh, but eventually there were, there were temples built, and archaeology has recently discovered a fascinating and very important idea. That, uh, that emerged in southeast Turkey. Here was the Fertile Crescent, which was the place, one of the first places in the Middle East where, whoops, this is the area where grain first grew wild. And that was one of the first things that human beings began to harvest began to, the, the beginnings of agriculture started with wheat. 
in the Middle East. And eventually these turned into, uh, into places where people would live. And uh, apparently in Southeast Assyria, right around where the, uh, can you see that arrow? There is a place called Gobleki Tepe, which was one of, whoops, sorry, one of the first places where they built huge temples. Now this was in, in the period for, between 12,000 and 9,000 BC. So right after the ice age had sort of melted away and they had already begun to build monumental art even without metal tools. It's an astonishing place. You can see that they have uncovered quite large areas here. And there you see it, Gobleki Tepe. Uh, there's a close-up of one of the monumental rocks, uh, one monumental stones that they somehow carved with stone tools and that supported some sort of roof, apparently. This is still coming to light, and you'll see about it in, in newspapers and magazines. Smithsonian Magazine had an interesting article about it. And uh, Patrick tells me he gets Archaeology Magazine, and they talk about it, too. Now, I wanted to talk about uh, the other civilizations that arose in the Fertile Crescent, which were all the earliest and important civilizations. Uh, Sumerians, uh, Egyptians, the Phoenicians, the Assyrians, Israel. All of these places uh, came into being as civilizations during the period from uh, 10,000 BC up to recorded history. Uh, but it seemed to me that uh, reading about those ancient civilizations, the one that came closest to us Unitarians seemed to be the Greeks. Now uh, you all know where Greece is, and it's not far from the Fertile Crescent, just a little north and to the left. <clears throat> a beautiful place. <clears throat> and of course the Greeks gave us a great deal of of our civilization and a great deal of our of our uh, thought as as Unitarians we are let me get back to my script here So Greek law had an, aimed entirely, it was not intended to carry out the will of either a monarch or a god. The Greeks were humans and humanists. And the Greek law entired, uh, aimed entirely at improving the lot of mortal human beings. And while those earlier systems could be changed virtually at the will of a king or a priesthood, Greek law was usually based on popular consent and could be changed only by being referred to the people for their approval. Greek art, of course, was the first great art. Now, the art of the Persians and the Egyptians was magnificent and monumental, but the Greeks believed in moderation and they, they formed the, uh, these statues, that's the Hermes of Praxiteles and the Winged Victory, which is the most prominent first statue you see at the Louvre. Praxiteles believed that, uh, the, that the human figure should be a combination of strength and grace. And he certainly achieved that with this statue of Hermes, uh, and the, there's a baby right here. That's the baby Dionysus. It suited their mythology, which was all about the Greek gods, which were variations on the human 
psychology and human personality. The, so, so great was the uh, Greek prestige in the uh, fields of medicine, astronomy, geography, and so on, that their ideas in those fields were not questioned until the 17th century. So Galen, for instance, was the go-to person for medical answers throughout the Middle Ages, and it was not until uh, modern science came along that Galen was proved a little behind the times. They invented poetry, comedy, tragedy, and theater. And their art was always to uh, honor moderation as well. And in that regard, they, they invented what's called the golden mean, which was something Pythagoras found in uh, the triangle, that the ratio between the different sides of a right triangle follow a, a law that he named the golden mean. And I'm sure that most of you have seen, I mean, there's a theater. Come on. The golden mean was very important in their architecture. Here we have a, uh, anyone who's taken art or philosophy in college knows that the golden mean is a rectangle where, which can be morphed into a, a square and copy itself. Uh, Walt Disney put out a great uh, program years ago which demonstrated this uh, with a uh, chambered nautilus. So I'm sure there are people in the room who understand and know and have studied Greek philosophy. And I'd like to open the floor to a conversation now. Uh, here are busts of Plato and Aristotle, the two important philosophers that we still study in college. Uh, Aristotle was Plato's student and Alexander the Great's teacher. All right. So are there any questions or comments in the room here? Anyone? Yes, can you, uh, yeah, get a microphone for people. Elizabeth will. Yeah, and we can move the camera. And thanks especially to Elizabeth who has brought us a great deal of technological expertise now to our services, even though I've been fumbling the ball badly. Uh, Hollis, go ahead. Well, Mike, <clears throat> I've studied art all my life. I have a degree in fine arts, which never gave me any money. But I, like Mike, uh, I feel I'm an artist myself. I've indulged in all kinds of creative pursuits. The Greek, uh, this is era, I guess, pre-Christian. And to me, once you make a religious object, like to venerate a god, it seems like that's more craft and that art is something which exists solely for its own beauty, for its own sake. It's sweet, generous, a thing in itself. So that was my little comment. Thank you. Yes, and I believe the golden mean even shows up in music, does it not? Pythagoras was, uh, as well as a ge geometric, a geometry maven, understood music. And the golden mean applies to the, the sound of a string brought into tension, as a piano is, and the, the, if you hold it halfway, you, and that is how they arrived at the, this musical scale. It was a mathematical decision, and mathematics was definitely the area that the Greeks excelled at. Euclid, 
and many others. And the Greeks gave us a huge amount of human knowledge. I have a, I have a, uh, a copy of Classical Greeks in the Great Ages of Man book published by uh, Time Life. And here they have a two-page spread of the Great Greeks. Let me just go down a few of these. Aristotle, who was the creator of a philosophy as vastly influential as that of his teacher, Plato, but opposed to it, believing that all theory must follow demonstrable fact, he based his system on direct observation and strict logic. Others, Alexander the Great, successor to his father Philip II, King of Macedon, Alexander launched a 13-year career of conquest that spread his empire and Greek culture around the Eastern Mediterranean. He conquered Egypt, and the principal city of Egypt after Alexander was Alexandria. And in Alexandria, the most famous library in, ancient, in the ancient world was created that lasted until, I believe, the realm of Julius Caesar, hundreds of years later. So let's see who else, poets and historians? Well, Aeschylus, who wrote many tragedies. Euripides, I remember it was uh, always fun in, in theater class to mention Eurip Euripides, Eumenides. Herodotus, the historian. Homer, of course. Homer actually wrote the longest epic poem we have from that time, uh, spontaneously, apparently, and he repeated it over and over again. It was an oral tradition, and there are still oral uh, people who uh, do their country's epics in Yugoslavia, I believe, in, in some of the ancient cultures there. Hippocrates was a, was a doctor and created the Hippocratic Oath, which is still part of medical school. First, do no harm. And Socrates. Socrates was also a friend of Plato, and Plato uh, wrote the Apology, which was about Socrates' death, about his acceptance of death and his willingness to drink the hemlock and go ahead and die because he had somehow or other, he had been judged to have offended the law of Athens, and he was so supportive of the law of Athens, that he willingly went to his death rather than fight it. Uh, I'll leave this book available to the rest of you to look at, and I'm sorry that uh, we don't have an opportunity to share it with the, uh, the Zoom attendees. But uh, Rose says, oh, yes, we could. Yeah, okay, great. Any questions? Yes, Diane. Come up and get a, get a microphone. We got to have a microphone because it's technology time around UU. Thank you for the brief synopsis of Greek uh, art and cave art and philosophers. I really enjoyed that. I saw that your talk today is art and religion. Yes. And in my own mind, I understand how those are they, they are intertwined. But I'm curious about how you see in your own mind art and our UU principles. So just ah. if you could tie that together, that would be helpful for Gladly. me. Gladly. Yeah, the question is, how do I tie art and our UU principles together? It seems to me that art is, the, as I said at the beginning, the human imagination is probably the most important aspect of our human life. 
and the art that we produce is the clearest, I think, the clearest example of our human imagination brought into existence. And that's why I think the cave art that we began with may tell something about what humanity is about, about why we exist and what we are here to do. <clears throat> do you agree with me or not that cave art is often beautiful and at least moving, and especially if you consider that they had to do it in the dark, had to do it by candle, by cave light, by uh, torchlight, and that uh, there, were, there were magnificent paintings made by the artists of prehistory. Uh, that's why I, I think it's important that we have a little gallery here and that we exp expose our congregation to the best that we can find in art. Uh, we've also had many music events here. Hollis has uh, been in charge of producing some of those, and we've had great musicians here. And in fact, we had an art show not long ago with a great jazz trumpeter, who, uh, jazz trombonist, Joe Logano, who uh, put on a little show here. Saxophone, well, yes, he, he did play drums here. You're right. Yes, Hollis, more? Where's his microphone? Yeah, the issue of art and religion is a big one. Uh, I don't know, what can we conceive could be Unitarian Universalist religious art? Uh, if any of you have our UU World, by the way, if you come here, we have many free issues. You can take any one of them. They're all for your taking. Should you wish to look at our yeah, UU World. Our magazine. These magazines have often some beautiful artwork in them by various artists. And many of them seem religious to me. Uh, perhaps we don't have things that are objects of worship, uh, such as you would see in more ancient religions. Uh, uh, just recently I went to Graymore, which is a Catholic friary, a uh, huge place. They do a lot of drug rehab there. It's a, just a celebration of a thousand years or more of Catholic uh, belief. And there are huge statues everywhere, Saint Anthony, Saint this, Saint that. Uh, many of them, we could see it, that's a piece of artwork. We put it in our house or in our yard. Yet, uh, to a Catholic, it's not art, it's a holy object. So that's a lot of food for thought right there. What is a holy object and what is art? Yes, if you've ever been to Rome and seen the uh, magnificent St. Peter's Cathedral and the Sistine ceiling. I believe Patrick has a comment. Once again, Mike, a fantastic presentation. Um, well illustrated, thoughtful. The one thing I, I want to give a perspective on is that there's a tendency in Europe and in the United States to uh, trace um, the um, prehistoric period through the uh, Middle East, Tigris, Euphrates, and Nile valleys to Greece, and then to the advanced civilizations of Europe, which is the pinnacle of human development and stuff. But, you know, if you look at um, any period of anything that was happening in the Middle East or Europe, and you compare that to China, yes. um, mm. you know, the, Chinese art was technically superior, especially in metalwork, uh, at any period incomparable to uh, European art up until the time they had foreign dynasties ruling them. Absolutely. And, um, produced great works of religious and secular art and stuff for household use that's um, unquestionably better than uh, similar periods in Europe. 
Absolutely. I have to agree, Patrick. And uh, in, in exactly the same way, the art of ancient America was very artistic. Their art was a little questionable to some of us since it included human sacrifice, but that was their religion and it developed uh, to a, a great extent. The, the Mayans, for instance, had a language, a, a written language, long before we were able to uh, work out the hieroglyphics of Egypt, they had, uh, they had over 700 uh, signs and symbols, each one of which, sometimes it was phonetic, sometimes it was uh, pictograph. So it was a combination of both Chinese writing and English, if you like. So it's a fascinating thing to read about. I've got a book, uh, one of the uh, great books on uh, the, the Aztecs and American ancient civilization. Yes, David. Could you drop the mask, David, because we yeah. need to hear you well. Yeah, you have a beautiful voice, by the way. I'm sure we all appreciate that. Um, yeah, but uh, my, my view of art is that it stems from our ability to be creative. And that creativity allows us to also be objective and to be compassionate. That's right. But uh, that, that creativity, to me, is limited by religion. Religion, to me, is a neurosis. It's a form of neurosis. It's uh, replacing real needs with symbolic things that are attainable, but you couldn't get the other thing. Um, so to me, when I ever talk to religious people, they are less creative. Like if you go to a more religious place than this, <laughs> they, 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 the creativity is less, and they actually get upset if you take too many different views on a subject, which is the source of creativity. They also get upset with objectivity. I don't get upset. I want to know what the golden mean means. <laughs> I'm going to get your ear. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, you know, this is the beautiful thing about Unitarians is that we're, we really embrace creativity, objectivity, and compassion. Yes. And we blend them together. And I think that is a big, huge leap from cave art and anything else. And oh, yes. art, can, art can be, you know, in a diminutive kind of way, creative. But uh, ultimately, the real art comes, is growing and maturing. And I see Unitarianism as a part of that evolution. Every day, every year, we have new artists emerge. Yes, it's true. I think human creativity and the human art is a huge body of work. I wanted to say one yes, more Diane. thing. When I look around this room and I see nature in those paintings and I see the divine and the mystery, that reflects uh, my Unitarian beliefs as well. So Good. I brought it home just looking at those beautiful pictures and thinking about the mystery in nature and whatever it is above us, if you have yes. God or divine. Art, art is spirit. a language of its own. And it's the kind of language that every receiver, everyone who looks at it or hears it, gets, it gets their own personal message. It's quite important, I think, to uh, marry the two, art and religion. Yes, Bill. Yeah, this is a little, little bit off the subject, but uh, etymology is an interest of mine. And um, you, know, you mentioned uh, you know, the Hippocratic Oath, etc. Hold the microphone close. Okay, you mentioned like the Hippocratic Oath and Hippocrates, but you know we we have you know, we have the word hypocrisy, you know, in the English language, which sounds counterintuitive to have been derived from Hippocrates. I'm not sure about the. Uh, etymological uh, descent of the word hypocrisy and how it applies to yeah. it. It's kind of, it just kind of struck the me as you talking about it. Yeah. Uh, 
But that's an interesting question. It definitely it's Trivial, is. but just man. Yes, someone's on the screen. Would you like to uh, speak up? Whoever, whoever has their hand raised. Uh, yes, I'm Naeem. I sorry, I, I was late to join your uh, lecture. If, is it uh, possible to get the recording? Is it possible to get a recording of your lecture? Yes, it is. How can I get that? I mean, after the service. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, send us a message. The website. Yes, yes, it's on our website. It usually in a couple of weeks. Yeah, you can see previous uh, services on our website. I'm not sure exactly how it's done, but there is a chapter on UUCRT.org. And if you go there, you'll find out all about us. We've got a huge amount of material there on the website. Okay. Well, it looks like it's time to uh, bring this to a conclusion. And I, for one, I'm interested in a cup of coffee. And I believe we're having a potluck today, yes. so we can eat as well as drink coffee. So we have a final hymn. Oh, no, it's Isaac Stern playing, playing Pythagoras', Pythagoras strings. Let's listen to what Pythagoras' boink boink turned into. <laughs> <laughs> 